Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar with LTS. Before I hand over to your speakers for the day, I have a couple of housekeeping points. So there will be time at the end of the presentation for Q&A. If you'd like to ask a question, you can use the box underneath the slides on your screen. This is private and we'll make sure we keep them anonymous when answering. You can also use this box to let me know if you're having any technical issues and I'll do my best to help you out and get you connected. There will be a couple of interactive polls during the webinar. These will pop up on the screen over your slides, so please do answer them when they do. And be aware that if you're watching the webinar in full screen mode, you'll need to exit full screen mode to see the polls, but I'll remind you of this when they come round. So your speakers for today are Dr. Marco Emgenborg, Corporate Vice President and Head of Pharmaceutical, Pharmaceutical Development at LTS Lawman, and Casey Sharp, Director, U.S. Business Development, also at K uh, LTS Lawman. And with that, I'll hand over to Casey for the start of the presentation. Josh, thank you very much, and welcome everyone to the LTS Oil Thin Film webinar uh, today. Thank you for joining. Uh, a bit of uh, background and snapshot into LTS, the organization at large. Um, we are the largest uh, CDMO um, in this space. Uh, our core technologies uh, are grounded and based in coding technology, and through that coding technology, we are able to derive two distinct dosage forms. Dosage form one would be traditional transdermals, which, by the way, we'll have webinar towards the latter half of the year on transdermals as well as oral thin films, which will be the focus for today. So from our coding technology, two distinct and unique dosage forms uh, coming out of uh, that technology. Um, if we look at our, the future of our organization. Um, we also are focused in microarray patches uh, or microneedles as they're commonly known. And the goal would be to bring forward small molecule as well as large molecules through the skin using our microarray patch technology. And the fifth window pane here in this slide uh, focuses on co-creation and how we work with, with uh, partners and customers uh, through collaborations as well as partnerships. Our traditional business model would be to take your API and bring it into one of our unique dosage forms, as well as developing our own uh, products uh, for out licensing in the marketplace as well. In a nutshell, that is LTS. Uh, organizationally, geographically, uh, here on this slide, you'll see we have three um, different sites. One is in uh, West Caldwell, New Jersey, which is focused on commercial manufacturing, mainly for the U.S. market, so quite a large uh, footprint there. Our headquarters is in Annena, Germany roughly one hour from Frankfurt Airport, depending uh, uh, on your speed of travel by car. Uh, this is a manufacturing site, as well as our global center for research and development of all of our technologies. In addition, we have a business office in Shanghai, China, uh, which deals with all of our uh, business doings in the Asian region. Um, if we look at the left-hand side of this slide, you see we have roughly 1,100 employees about $300 million uh, a year uh, in uh, revenue. Of that revenue, we invest 8.4% back into the organization. So roughly $25 million a year goes back into the organization to further develop our technologies, uh, to develop our capabilities, as well as our market position uh, and how we can service uh, our potential customers in the pharmaceutical environment. Uh, we are a technology company with nearly uh, 5,000 patents and over 300 patent families, which is very important when we look for drug development and uh, building intellectual property for market exclusivity with your products. To date, uh, we have about um, 1 billion units manufactured between the two sites on an annual basis, so our coding capacities are quite large uh, compared to the industry. Uh, currently, uh, 30 products and projects in our pipeline, and our manufacturing space is roughly 60,000 square meters uh, or 200,000 square feet. Uh, broadly speaking, that's LTS, and I turn it back over to you, Josh. Thank you. 
Thank you, Casey. So we have our first poll question of the presentation now. So remember, if you're watching in full screen, then just exit full screen to, to answer. So the question is, do you or does your company have any experience in transmucosal drug delivery? And if yes, which kind of products do you have? So the options here are yes, transmucosal sprays, transmucosal lozenges, transmucosal films, yes, others, no, but you do have some sublingual tablets or just a straight no. So if you could answer that on your screen now, then we'll start to see the results coming in shortly. Okay, I can see some results coming in already. Marco, can you see those? Uh, not yet. You may need to press the gather poll results button to see them. I'm just doing that. So from what I can see, it's an overwhelming no. We have 64% uh, of the respondents have answered no there. Um, yep. And the next highest one we have Yes, it's the transmucosal films at 22%. And then the, uh, the answers are kind of spread fairly evenly, um, about sort of 3 or 4 or 5% between the other answers there. Okay. So first of all, also from my side, a warm, warm welcome for today's webinar. And uh, regarding the answer of poll question number one, it's pretty surprising. Um, but it's also good to see that um, OTFs might not only be an alternative for transmucosal delivery, but uh, it would be interesting to see what your ideas would be after the, today's webinar. So, and with that, I would like to start to give you a short introduction in our thin firms, especially for those of you who haven't worked on this and they don't have a, a right background. So, OTFs, or thin firms, are still, as we think, an innovative approach for all drug delivery. It's an easily edible dosage forms and um, the API can be formulated into the film and therefore taken up either by the oral mucosa or been used as a standard oral route for the drug to be taken up by the GI tract. The most convenient part of an OTF is, of course, it can be taken without additional water. And especially in the U.S. market, most people know OTFs from the time that uh, we pioneered this field together with our partners by launching the first consumer product in the field in the year 2000, which were the Listerine pocket packs. They are still on the market after 20 years and still manufactured by LTS. Of course, API drug-free, but the concept is pretty clear. Now, if you're looking at the advantages that we can achieve with an oral thin film for drug delivery, especially when we're looking at the absorption kinetic, it, uh, our thin films allow us to, to tailor um, the kinetics in a way that we can either be CMAX focused or more AOC focused so the, the films can achieve a fast onset of action if, if wanted or we can improve bioavailability. Um, by going through the oral mucosal uptake uh, we can avoid a hepatic first pass effects and also we can reduce the variability for the drugs coming, coming along with any food effects. Um, by taking this medication without need, the need to swallow the, the, the drug, like a tablet, uh, we can improve patient compliance. And therefore, it's, it's pretty well suitable for applications in pediatric or ger geriatric uh, populations. So now let's talk about the right application site. Of course, when you're looking at the oral cavity, you can basically apply the film everywhere in the, in the, in the mouth. But at the end of the day, it comes down to three distinct also commercially viable or usable um, application sites. And I would like to go through them each by one. Um, each site also has an effect on the PK profile, and therefore it it's kind of triggers the choice of the site. Um, the first one is like glycerin strip being applied lingually. So the lingually applied or thin film should disintegrate pretty fast. So within, within seconds, we come to that later. Um, very often, lingually applied by oral thin films are by equivalent to immediate release tablets. So the API is basically swallowed after the film disintegrates and they get taken up by the GI tract. But depending on the API properties and the physical chemical uh, parameters, also a fast onset of action is possible due to an additional oral mucosal uptake. 
The second route, which I think commercially is the most, uh, most um, successful way, is the sublingual uh, application of oral thin films, especially used for fast onset of action and also to use it to be used for an increased bioavailability. But also these films still need to be disintegrated pretty quickly also to, to ensure patient compliance. The third route is the buckle application, and this is mainly driven to increase bioavailability. Because these films usually take much more time to disintegrate, so we have a delayed and reduced Cmax. It's more AOC focused, and especially if there are any side effects caused by the high Cmax, this can be somehow um, reduced by going through the buckle route. When we're talking about OTF formulations, LTS basically differentiates in between three different types. Number one, the fast disintegrating film. Number two is a kind of melt-away film or slowly eroding film. And number three is a slower non-disintegrating buckle film or a buckle patch. And let's go through them step by step. The first type, the fast disintegrating film, or as we call them, the flash wafer, are mostly a single layer OTF with a very highly soluble hydrophilic polymers as a film former, and the drug can either be really dissolved as a solution in this film or be suspended or as an emulsion. These films shall disintegrate within seconds, so best case five seconds roughly, sometimes a bit longer depending on the thickness and the loading of the, of the, of the API. Um, the trigger of using the fast disintegrating film is really a rapid onset of action, for example, via the oral mucosal absorption. Either being applied sublingually, as shown before, but also a buccally or even a lingual application could trigger this rapid onset. For the, normally, for a lingual application, a classical GI absorption is, is the target, uh, especially when the APIs are not very good water soluble and are mainly swallowed by the patients. The second type of OTFs are so-called melt-away films. They do disintegrate within several minutes, so in the range maybe of 5 to 30 minutes. And this can be tailored based on the, the target product profile that your product should have. Um, these films are mainly um, applied in the bucket cheek, and they consist of a single layer or multi-layer film, also based on soluble polymers, but of course not so highly uh, soluble as for the fast disintegrating films. What also can be done is that this film form a mucoadhesive gel after applied in the bucket sheet, and there it stays and releases very slowly the drug into oral cavity. The same type also can be uh, uh, even used for sampling replication. The third, time, uh, third type of an OTF are slow and non-disintegrating bucket films or so-called bucket patches. These are usually multi-layer combinations um, of soluble and low or insoluble polymers. Um, the first layer, the, the bottom layer, is a mucoadhesive layer, which then adheres to the bucket sheet or even the gingiva, but I think the main applications of a bucket patch would be the cheek. Um, so it has to be applied with the right uh, direction to with this mucoadhesive layer. And the second layer on top of it is really acting like a backing layer. It protects the API from being um, this dissolved from the oral um, cavity. It only it really protects that the API is only delivered via the surface area to the um, to the cheek to the bottom mucosa. So it's really like a kind of a bucket patch. When we're looking at these three different types of OTFs, we can kind of modulate the plasma profile by using these different types of formulations. And here we have the three as a scheme of the three types starting with the, the light green for the fastest integrating film, and when you look at the plasma concentration over the time, it really would be the fastest onset of actions with the highest Cmax. The second type, the green curve, is the melt-away film, and there you can see we can m reduce the Cmax and kind of delay the Cmax at the same time, but it's mo mostly AOC driven. The third, the gray curve, is really something modulating schematically um, the delivery as a bucket patch through the oral mucosa by only that surface area. But of course, it's, it's by far not as long as a transdermal patch, which, which takes for days or multiple day applications. Here we are still within a, 
a short range of a few hours, maybe tops. Now, before we go into the formulations and, and excipients and what's, what's new in this area for, o, for OTFs, I would like to take you through the uh, manufacturing of our thin films, which is pretty unique compared to other oral dosage forms. And as Casey mentioned at the beginning, everything is based on coding technologies and, and thin films. Yeah, this is what it makes kind of special. And we like to separate usually the standard production route for all thin films into four distinct unit operations, starting with the mass preparation, going to coating and drying, the third one is slitting, and the fourth one is the conversion or punching and pouching. And I would like to take you through these four steps in a bit more detail. Sorry. So the first step is the mass preparation. And as you can see here, it just shows uh, schematically just a mixing vessel of a certain size of a few hundred or up to 1,000 liters. And it can be as easy as it looks here that you simply mix all raw materials like polymers, flavors, sweeteners with the solvent together, and you add softeners, buffer salts, plus the API into this mixing and, and create a homogeneous solution out of it. But, of course, the reality never looks as easy as this. Very often we need additional integrating uh, steps like high-speed homogenizer or temperatures, certain temperature profiles to get everything dissolved or dispersed in the way that we need it for the next step. The usual batch sizes which are used on a commercial scale are in the range of 100 to 800 kilograms. Um, this can differ sometimes depending on the product volume, of course, but this is the standard range. This, this mixing vessel, which I've shown before, is then transferred to one of the coating lines. And you can see here a schematic view on, uh, on one of our mid-size coaters, uh, which we have. And this drug-containing mass is then transferred into the coating head. And here in this case, it's a two-row coater. There can also be alternative coating heads being used uh, for coating of OTFs. Um, an intermediate liner, which is the, the substrate for the coating, is pulled through this coating head, and by the gap between these two rolls, we can simply dose the, uh, the drug-containing adhesive mass to a certain thickness. Of course, wet, still containing the solvent. This coated um, adhesive mass is then on the liner transferred into one of into the drying oven, which in this case consists of four different zones and we can set up a distinct drying profile to achieve at the end of the drying uh, of a dry product, a dry film in a certain width. So at the very end of the, the process, this dried as laminate here in this case of, uh, uh, of liner and the drug containing matrix are wound up to create the master rolls. Uh, they can, depending on the coder, can be from easily 20, 30 centimeters up to uh, significantly above one meter. And the next step, we go to slitting. And here we slit the, the master roll with certain kind of scissor type of knives down to narrow rolls. And, and these narrow rolls are already predetermined in their widths by the product size. And these narrow rolls can be stored as you can see, uh, horizontally can be stacked pretty easily before it goes then into conversion, whereas the master rolls are pretty heavy by their own weight to store, so the narrow rolls are really preferred for that. The last step is the conversion step, and uh, as you can see here, a picture on the left side of a conversion line where the, the narrow roll is um, placed from the slitting machine, and here we can see that the, the narrow roll is further slit into small stripes, and from these small stripes, the, the OTFs are cut out in their dimensions uh, uh, along the processing uh, direction, and then they are transferred into the packaging material, potentially also filled with inert gas, where they are then individually sealed, and we end up with um, a sachet, a primary package pouch, like you see on the bottom left of this, of this slide, there's a single film in a single pouch being packaged. And this, I would say, the commercially, this is the, the main packaging 
design, which is seen for all FinFEMS. Now let's go to formulations and also what's new and what, what new opportunities they are based on, on, on OTFs. But before we go into the new stuff, I would like to give a, a review on the components which can be used in OTFs. So, of course, the, the, the main excipient which is necessary here are the film forming polymers or blends of these polymers. And the polymers of choice, as listed here, can be HBMC, polyethylene polyethylene oxide, uh, polyvinyl acetate hydroxypropyl cellulose, or even like uh, polyvinyl pyridones. Um, especially the first of them, um, I would say, are commercially the most um, um, important ones, uh, um, the first, first four of them maybe. And they're all water-soluble polymers which are, are used in there. Um, the formulation but also contains a lot, a lot of other excipients which are needed to create um, a tasteful, stable formulation. First of all, we need plasticizers and fillers to create a certain flexibility or stability of the film. Um, we need flavors and sweeteners, um, especially for those APIs which have their own kind of taste. Uh, often also formulation contains a certain kind of taste masking agents. Uh, sometimes very strongly bitter tasting APIs are really challenging to be delivered by the oromocosal route. Um, and due to that, this is also something very important I mean, in general for all our disintegrating dosage forms. Stabilizers can also be added to avoid any degradation. And um, we can also add buffer substances, which is pretty important to create a local pH environment, for example, in a sublingual area, which, which helps to, to get an optimal drug delivery through the mucosa at a certain pH, for example. Saliva stimulating agents are also important because we need sometimes just simply more fluid to dissolve the API, dissolve the film, and, and therefore these things can be added. Um, colorants, dyes are added, especially in the OTC field. For example, if the flavors are kind of a, a cherry flavor, then OTFs are usually kind of red or reddish, and uh, which would mostly make sense. As mentioned before, the packaging material is also very important, and most of them are coming in a single package sachet, and multi-pack packaging are, um, are of interest, but mostly used so far in, in this consumer field. So looking at challenges of OTF formulations, and here's a picture of something that nobody from the formulation perspective would like to see. So OTFs can have really physical instabilities, especially very classic formulations, with certain polymers, they can be formulated though so that at the end they are either too brittle, they break as, as shown here, or they can to be too soft or too sticky, so they would actually uh, stick everywhere where we, we can go through. So in these, let's call them suboptimal film formulations, can cause a lot of issues. So either they cause issues during manufacturing, especially during slitting and conversion, because either everything breaks or everything sticks to all the tunings, or it has, can create uh, compliance issues with the patients, especially if the OTF would be broken in the primary packaging, and the patients maybe only take part of the OTF, so they have an incomplete dosing, or the OTF sticks in the pouch, and it really makes it difficult for the patient to, to remove the film from the packaging material and actually also to have the right dosing. So the formulators of OTFs, they always have to consider manufacturing and the stability requirements of the Fs because they might look differently than the film right after formulating it. So now let's go to the new technologies we are offering and specifically I would like to explain you the foam OTF from LTS which is a pretty innovative new concept on the oil thin films. So the foam OTF are pretty ideal for fast disintegrating film either for the sublingual or lingual applications. In the meanwhile, we have also used um, melt-away films based on these foams for bu buckle application. By, the use, by, do, by using this foam technology, um, it allows us to really enlarge the formulation toolbox. So we have a much broader choice of synthetic film-forming polymers, which usually, without the foaming technology, would, would disintegrate within I don't know, minutes, 10, 20 minutes, maybe even, 
And by using the foam technology, we can increase uh, the degradation or decrease the degradation time significantly. Also, the all thin films have a significant improved soft mouth feeling. So they have, don't have sharp edges, even like on this picture here, you see it looks like um, edges, but they're really soft. So they're highly flexible and allow an adjustment in the oral cavity, um, if, especially if they're used in a sublingual or buckle form. Um, the formulations can be designed in a way that they do not form a gel, especially interesting for lingual formulation, um, because the mouth feeling is much better improved. But also we can tailor them to be more mucous adhesive in case you want to have a more melt-away uh, type of formulation. So the advantages of foam OTF, as you can see here also on these pictures, first of all is a high drug loading is possible. It's Due to this technology, we can, we can load the film significantly higher with API compared to other uh, simple film technologies. And by that, still maintain a certain mechanical stability. You can see here on the left what an old thin film can basically survive. You can bend them, you can squeeze them, and they, they're not breaking. So it has a very good processability. It also has a high stability at various humidity levels which comes by the choice of polymers, which we can use here compared to, for example, cellulose-based materials. Um, due to this, I would say, uh, uh, stability or physical stability at different humidity levels, it's also easy to remove from the primary packaging. It's, it has a soft touch, it's not sticky, it more feels like food instead of a plastic film, for example, like old OTFs very often look like. So, and also easy to handle since it's a different thickness, uh, especially at small sizes, below two square centimeters, uh, it's much easier to apply. On the bottom you see a cross section of the foam structure, including a lot of, lot of bubbles in there, which increase the surface area and which allows then a much faster disintegration time. So what we can do with the foam formulations, the options which we're having, the disintegration time can be tailored from seconds to, to up to several minutes. So, and this can be done, of course, by the, the polymers, the polymer blends, but also by the control of the pore structure. And by that, we can ensure really a constant product performance. Since there's a different thickness of this foam, it's not just a thin film of only 100 microns, we can, we can nicely load these OTF foams with particles. And due to the thicker structure, it does not feel like having a sandpaper on the mouth like old OTC products, especially in the US had the mouth feeling, which was not really favorable by patients. By having this foam structure, these um, particles like API resonance, for example, which have been used for taste masking, very often um, they are incorporated much, much more into the foam and therefore the, the patients do not really taste them and, and have them as a negative mouth feel experience. Also, other microparticulate technologies can be used in combination, um, and this is really open for that. So now, leaving the formulations, I would like quickly to jump into in vitro studies and in vitro permeation testing, and what what's new from LTS side on this field. Um, of course, what everybody knows, we can assess the drug permeation for the transoral mucosa delivery by typical front step type of experiments. But the way we are looking at dermals or transdermal products, the front cell type of experiments, appear not to be very suitable since it's a very static system and it's, it's something where you usually don't look at your topical dosage forms, how it behaves. So we came up with a different setup based on a front cell type of experiment, but it's much more easy to apply to have a visual look on the samples and I have a multiple sample study in comparing them and allows a much faster sampling within um, yeah, much shorter time periods than standard frontal experiments would, would allow. So on the left side you can see a picture starting at the top left where you see small OTF samples with dyes, colors. So we can see the disintegrating coming up. So on the bottom left after 10 minutes you can see the different formulations, how they have been disintegrating within a small amount of saliva over time. Um, so easily also monitoring just visually what was actually going to happen. 
Um, for this kind of experiments, we're using different mucosa models. Um, mostly use our porcine esophagus model because simply there's more area than the porcine cheek. Or we have cell culture models which can be used depending on the API and its properties. Now coming back to dosing, uh, sorry, to, to, to packaging and uh, multi-dosing. And um, as I talked before, so far commercially, most of the products, or almost all the products with the pharmaceutical are single packaged uh, products. And we have developed a concept for having uh, multi-use containers, especially maybe for OTC products, which allow a flexible dosing um, coming from a strip where there's a one, one of these uh, containers could be, I don't know, 20, 30, up to 100 doses being, being added and, and the patients can dose them as needed um, over a certain time. None of these containers or devices are yet on, on the market, but uh, we have some interest in the OTC field and we think that could be a suitable option to make a, a kind of differentiation from the single packaged uh, products which are out there. Thanks, Marco. So we're on to our second poll question now. And the question is, is there an API within your company's portfolio which you would potentially consider for transmucosal or oral delivery by OTF? It should be popping up on your screen now. And your options are yes, no, or I don't know. It would be quite interesting for us to see the results now since we think there is a in growing interest in all disintegrating dosage forms within the last years. We think OTFs could be a viable option there, but uh, let's see how the results are looking. So we have the bulk of them in already. I can see coming in at 47% uh, is yes. Uh, next, I don't know, at uh, just under 30, and then no at about 23, 24% there. Well, the majority is yes, so interesting to see. And uh, I mean, if you're interested in that, we are happy to, to get in closer contact. So, and I think from here on, we have a number of case studies which we like to present on our thin films and um, to show you the different advantages which can be achieved by this dosage form. The first um, case study is focusing on the fast onset of action. Especially this one was an API which was already available as a tablet formulation from the innovator. And we have worked with the innovator here in this case, and we have transferred this into a different film formulation. So you can see here by the PK profile um, that there's uh, one innovator tablet, the, the green curves, and there's a number of, of OTF film formulations which have been tested in a clinical trial and in a clinical setup. And in this case, the film formulation contained about 50% of the dose, but we can achieve almost the same, about the same Cmax with the best formulation, um, which in this case was the suitable target which we want to achieve. Uh, you can see also the properties of the API right here. Uh, it has a log P, which is pretty well suitable for a transmucosal delivery of about three, and a certain solubility which is also needed to achieve that. Uh, so overall, this case study from moving to a tablet to the old thin film allowed us really to, to have a, the similar Tmax as said before, but at a much lower Tmax, so faster onset of action. AOC with 50% of the dosing was about 55% of the tablet, so we can achieve the same uh, Tmax as said before with half the dose. We can reduce drug, drug exposure and also possible side effects which coming along with the, with the drug exposure. And so we're really focusing on the fast onset of action, which is really suitable, like in this case, for this API, for a short duration of action, action for an acute episodic treatment um, in this case. And that was what we achieved with this case study. The second case studies, and these are interesting pictures to show, are um, an increased a drug and API, which in this case also undisclosed, which we need to increase significantly the bioavailability. And this proof of concept study was, as, been, as can be seen on these pictures, 
a bigger dark preclinical study, a pharmacokinetic study using kind of melt away OTFs for a buckle application. And the beagle dog is pretty, pretty interesting animal to do so. And you can see here two types of formulation in the upper row and the bottom row, which have been used in the study. The upper row shows a melt away OTF, which I've explained before. It can be applied to the bucket cheek. It forms a mucoadhesive adhesive gel, which you can see here in the pictures, the orange film, which is here applied. After 15 and 30 minutes, you still see the remaining gel with the orange color, um, the orange dye in here, which remains in the, in the flu of the dark. Uh, so after 90 minutes, about that, um, all of the orange color is gone, all of the gel disappeared, and, uh, and the dog were not sedated, so they could also lick at the film, so you can see how pretty good these uh, melt away films adhere to the, to the bucket cheek and cannot easily be removed just by the tongue. Uh, the bottom row, it's, it's a formulation which is somewhat not a fast disintegrating film, medium time film, I would say, so which does not disintegrate within seconds, but a few minutes. And you can see starting with this orange film um, on the mucosal tissue, within five minutes only small pieces are remaining, and after 10 minutes everything is gone. And by this, different disintegration times and residence times on the because of tissues, we can achieve, or we could achieve in this uh, feasibility study, a uh, different PK profiles. And these were the results here of the PK data of this API. So it was a very lipophilic drug, and due to this high first pass effect, it has a very low bioavailability. So as you can see, it was applied to the bigger dogs, and we compared these two different formulations. In both formulations, the API was simply dissolved, so not dispersed emulsified that were dissolved in the film in order to present it immediately in a dissolved form uh, to, to increase the oral mucosa uptake. Um, so the gray curve you can see here in the pro profile, uh, which was the, the film which disintegrates faster, so after 10 minutes thing, everything was gone, was loaded with 7.5 milligrams of this API. And by moving into the melt away film, which is here the green curve, which has a slightly lower loading due to the formulation type to still have it dissolved in the formulation. We could significantly increase the AUC, which was the key driver here within this project, which was needed compared to the oral dosage form. So, next uh, case study is also about increasing bioavailability, but mainly the focus here was the reduction of hepatotoxicity. This is a preclinical study which we performed with the API Agomelatine. And here we have an OTF for buckle application, and I will explain the picture a bit later. Um, Agomelatine is used for the treatment of major depressive disorders, and it has a very low bioavailability, which about single digits, 1 to 5%, which is a key driver to go through the buckle application to increase bioavailability. The target product profile looked the way that the application should be over within less than three hours and should be taken in the evening. And the size of an OTF, so the maximum size overall, should be less than five square centimeters, whereas the active part is only 1.6 square centimeters. And I will show you later in the next slide how this looked like actually. The drug loading is about 1.6 milligram. And as said before, the transmucosal delivery is the target to avoid the first pass effect and therefore reducing the hepatotoxicity. The problem of the API and the kind of side effect uh, is the dysgeusia, which this causes a kind of a taste disorder, which is caused by this uh, API. It's a kind of capsulogenic taste, very hot, very sharp, and uh, we were looking at preventing that by adding a backing layer, as shown before, for this kind of bucket patches, which act as a physical barrier. And when you look here at the, at the picture on the right, this is actually is looking into the mouth of a mini pig, a Göttingen mini pig, which was used for the study. There's a limited area available for applying an OTF. So compared to the beagle dogs, this is a bit smaller, so we would not be able to apply OTFs, which were much larger than that. But uh, in this case, the, the, beagle, the beagle dog was not the preferred choice for this preclinical study. We moved to the mini pegs. 
And you can see here this the bluish uh, kind of OTFs, and you see a, a red inner part. And how this looks like, how it's designed, I will show in the next slide. So we have actually used three different prototypes in this study. So the prototype number one, you can see a red inner part containing the API, and there's a blue uh, overlapping dissolving backing layer, which should prevent the API from being released into the oral cavity to create this uh, side effect of dysusia. And the second prototype, very similar, has also this inner API containing, containing part, which is shown in red here, um, together with a non-dissolving backing. And the third OTF which was applied was simply the inner, inner part, um, and this was used without the overlapping ba backing, and um, yeah, to see what this has an impact on the PK profile. And these were the results. So when looking at the plasma concentration over time, prototype number one and two actually showed a pretty similar drug release over a certain time um, until the remains uh, of the, the films have been removed, uh, about half of this curve here. Um, so it has a constant delivery through the mucosa tissues as targeted, as wanted. And when we don't use the overlapping backing, of course, then the API is re released in, throughout the whole oral cavity, and we have a maximum spreading of surface area of the mucosa tissues, and therefore we can easily see here in this case the four times increasement of the IOC by the prototype number three. Of course, this was not the target one, but you can see here the difference of a bucket patch together with the kind of melt away film. So, the, the interpretation of this proof of concept study that we have seen actually nice PK data which were comparable with the in vitro mucosa permeations based on the systems I've showed you before um, with this FRANCEP type of system, especially since it's a pretty static delivery um, by a bucket patch. We have observed no irritation on the mucosa tissues for, um, with the mini pigs here, and um, the overlapping backing, of course, prevented us of, of uh, uh, having a high AOC so that the highest AUC was, was achieved by the film without the, the backing, but the one with the overlapping backing, which prevents the side effects, showed even sufficient high plasma concentrations so that the, the prototype design, the feasibility was, was feasible, and we could de de uh, develop an OTF based on this technology. So, and for the next kind of case study, I would also like to hand over again to Casey, please. Yes, thank you, Marco. Uh, very good so far. So this is a nice commercial case study, I think, is, uh, is, is worthy to discuss here today. Uh, this is the Suboxone Oral Thin Film product. Uh, this was a life cycle management uh, play for Rekha Benkheiser, uh, going from their uh, solid oral dissolving tablets uh, to the uh, oral thin film. And uh, I think it's important to kind of jump into um, this commercial play and why it's important and how it can be applied to potential partnerships in the future. So a bit of background of, of the Suboxone uh, product itself. The, as I mentioned, the, um, uh, the, the tablet itself came off the market around 2014, replaced by the oral thin film. And why was that important and how does that have commercial relevance? So the uh, solid oral product itself was losing patent exclusivity and uh, with a $2 billion per annual uh, product, um, it was important for um, the organization to find a way to protect that franchise. By doing so, they converted their current dosage form, as mentioned, was a oral dissolving tablet into the oral thin film. Um, this is also important because, which we'll get into the next slide, because of pricing and, and value uh, in the marketplace. Um, but as we go through the slide here, um, in 2010, the film uh, was launched, uh, which was the, not coincidentally the same year the patent of the tablets were expiring. And what record did is they uh, migrated the uh, patient population from the tablet to the oral thin film over a period of a couple of years. Once they had su sufficient migration of patients to the film itself, they actually removed the tablet from the market. Thus, any generic entry was impossible because there was no reference product. 
why this is important commercially is the, the film itself gave Reckitt an additional eight to nine years of market exclusivity. Um, we see in, on the last line here, the first generics into the oral thin film suboxone market didn't occur until 2019. So from a life cycle management commercial perspective, this was a brilliant way to protect nearly $2 billion of revenue on an annual basis for nearly an additional decade uh, by simply going from one dosage form to the other and removing the uh, reference product from the market. Um, quite brilliant from a business perspective. This next slide here is important that the two data points I want to zero in here um, are the sales in 2018 as well as 2019. As mentioned, generic entry did not occur in, until 2019. Traditionally, what we see with traditional products, excuse me, the slide move forward. Traditionally, what we see with generic products is once there is generic competition, price erosion is massive. So when we think of tablets, capsules, injectables, once there is generic entry into the, into the market, price erosion uh, goes to the floor. If we look at column uh, in 2018, as mentioned, prior to generic entrance, the product itself was nearly $2 billion in revenue. 2019, we see there are now uh, four generic entrants into the market, as well as the RLD, excuse me, three generic entrants, as well as the reference product. And the price erosion has only gone down $100 million. So this is significant when we're talking about a, a highly complex dosage form, like the oral thin film, recognizing there's very limited organizations globally who can produce these products, as well as the number of players once the product goes generic, price erosion does not occur at the same rate as in the traditional dosage forms. Uh, so I think that's very important when looking at uh, the potential for um, using oral thin films in the commercial uh, space. Um, with that, Marco, I'll hand it back over to you. Okay, thank you. So, so now at the beginning, Casey talked about what LTS is pursuing beyond oral thin films. And I think that's pretty interesting also for, for you to know that it's not just the film technologies as they were so far. So we are open to, to pursue new technologies, to deduct liver technologies based on our core competencies, competencies we're having. One of these partnerships we're having is with the company Intech Pharma. It's an Israeli company who developed the so-called accordion pill technology. And LTS is acting as a commercial manufacturing partner for this technology. Um, the accordion pill, as you can see here on the left schematic view, here is um, a drug form where a film is actually folded into a capsule. And this capsule can then be dissolved in a stomach, for example, the film unfolds, and from there it releases the drug. So it's pretty highly suitable for highly drug loading, and especially for APIs with narrow absorption windows, uh, pure solubilities, and they can act locally in the stomach or the upper GI tract as a gastroretentive system. And here on the bottom, you can see also some pictures of the building and the manufacturing machines, equipment used to produce these kind of accordion pits. But everything is based on a fit technology, so coding is also a key essential here, of course, in this product. The second collaboration we are pursuing right now is an earlier stage. It's a collaboration with a Swiss company called Isocap. It's a complete new delivery technologies, but also using thin film know-how that we're having at LTS. Um, so we are working on this together. It's a new delivery technologies. Unfortunately, I cannot so show any pictures really proprietary and so far undisclosed, but it's for a local treatment of diseases in the upper GI tract, like the esophagus, that's where the name is coming from. And this technology was developed by the University of Greifswald in Germany, in the upper east part of Germany at the, at the seaside, and then being commercialized by ESOCAP. Um, the device, which a uh, device part, which is also uh, um, an element of the ESOCAP, is already CE certified, and it's now ready to be used in the upcoming clinical study. The first indication which is developed is uh, an ESOCAP application for the eosinophilic esophagitis. 
It's a rare inflammatory disease of the esophagus. And this um, project has uh, already achieved the orphan drug designation from the US FDA uh, last year. So beyond that, we are also looking at new levels of OTFs where we can go into new therapy fields, therapy areas beyond using OTFs for small molecules. So therefore, we think that based on our core technologies, we can go into immunotherapies where we can go through the oral mucosa. So we have either buckle or sublingual delivery of vaccines, for example, or where we can achieve uh, sublingual immunotherapy like a slit type of formulation yeah, with, with allergies. So we are open for pursuing this kind of innovations based on our technologies and to open our, our field in this area. And if any of the companies are willing to collaborate, we're open to start the discussions from here. So now let me summarize on OTFs and transmogosal delivery, what we can offer from our side and what OTFs can really achieve. So we think OTFs are proven options to improve bioavailability as shown in the case studies by going directly to the own mucosal tissue. We can avoid the first pass effects also as shown, for example, to reduce certain side effects. The faster onset of action is something where the OTFs basically stands for as the fastest integrating dosage forms. And this is the key component, which the key element, which is usually uh, um, addressed by an OTF. We can also reduce the drug dosing, as shown in the one of the first case studies, um, by achieving the same Cmax with the, with the half of the dose. We can modulate the PK profiles, as shown before in the case studies, so to achieve certain uh, plasma, plasma levels to target the, the indication or the, the, the product um, for certain patients. Also, patient compliance uh, is are improved since we do not have to take this medication by water, and therefore it's really uh, uh, suitable in certain patient populations. We open also to follow these new partnerships, as mentioned before, based on these kind of combinations, new technologies to, together with our, our core competencies. So, and by that, we are through with our today's webinar, and I would like to thank you for your attention. And now we have significant time for your questions. And uh, yeah, I hand over back to you, Josh. Thank you, Marco, and, and thank you, Casey, for your, your presentation. I can see from the number of questions that we've had in that it was very engaging and very interesting for our audience. So um, let's crack on, shall we, uh, uh, with the first question. So the first question is, how does the tongue location influence bioavailability? Good point. I don't know if I know, understand the question correctly, uh, or maybe you you mean the the film on the tongue. Well, um, I think it's important to have a significant compliance on the way the film is applied because there's of course a certain variability. So that's something which needs to be addressed. That any way you apply it on the tongue or any way you apply it under the tongue is the variability is is covered by by a clinical study, but since the way it's been dosed compared to other dosage forms, I think it's much better controllable by the film than compared, for example, to granules or, or drops, for example. Yeah. Thank you. And the next one. Can the fast disintegrating type handle bitter drugs or APIs? I think yes. That's something to be answered. The generic answer first. Um, there are have been products on the market and something also we're looking into where the APIs are kind of in a complex um, to prevent that it's taken up by the, um, the oral mucosal tissue. So it's really for a lingual application where it's swallowed and the API is then released from this complex in the stomach. So it's this classical GI absorption at the end of the day. Um, that's the way it's been handled. But of course, um, formulating this in the, within a complex has also an impact on the drug loading, which can be achieved. So then we have a reduction of the maximum API we can formulate, I would say. Thank you, Marco. How do you assess the bitterness of the API before designing the formulation? What sort of taste masking do you use generally? That's, that's a good point, and that's the challenge for all oral dissolvable dosage forms. Um, 
Um, very often we work together with our partners because they have more more experience on their specific APIs. We have when we when we're looking doing this on our own, we have certain collaborations for some in vitro assessment, but also for preclinical studies to do this bitter assessment. Uh, and yes, of course we can do, do taste masking, and this is I can say we're using all sorts of technologies which are out there. Um, there's Something we which we do a lot of things with flavors or kind of bitter blockers, uh, for example, uh, which can be used. And depending on where which, which which receptor the API is binding to, that's something we can look into. But in general, that's a problem or a challenge that every formulator had to go through for all these other dosage forms. And at the end of the day, a clinical study or a panel study, depending on the API, will bring the final decision in the final results. And what is the target moisture content of the OTF? And how do you determine this? I.e. balance flexibility with API stability? Um, yeah, this depending on, on the formulation, depending on the polymer. And yeah, how to determine this, I would say this is a bit uh, a, this is standard on one hand, but also proprietary on the other hand. Uh, you can find that literature how to measure uh, water content in oral thin film. You need the water for some of the polymers, uh, especially for example for HVMC, where you need a certain percentage. It can be in the range of 5%, for example, maybe a bit more than that, to create a, f a flexible, stable formulation. But of course, if you increase more and more API, it becomes more uh, brittle, more stiff. And um, but you wouldn't balance this with more moisture. You would balance this differently by the formulation. With the new technologies we're having, like the foam, it's a bit more easy to control, and it looks a bit different than that. Thanks, Marco. And will this work with oil? Principally, yes. You, we can formulate oil um, in. Since these are all very highly water-soluble uh, polymers, you can create a kind of an oil and water emulsion and formulate it that way. Uh, of course, the drug loading, that's something which needs to be assessed. Um, we have also worked on this um, within the feasibility and have some IP on that. It's simply a kind of inner phase of an oily, oily uh, phase where the API might be dissolved, for example, or the API is the oil itself. Depends. Yeah, this, can, this works. Great. Uh, what is the minimum and maximum viscosity of the wet blend that can be cast into a thin film? That's a good point, and uh, I actually um, I don't know the exact numbers. And if I would, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't disclose it, maybe. But we can. I mean, the wet film. When you've seen the picture of the coder, where we transfer the coded film upside into the drying oven, of course. The viscosity has to be so high that the coated film sticks onto the substrate. So if it's flowing down, of course, as you know already, it's too too low from the viscosity. The upper limit, that's difficult to define because there are different coating technologies which can also um, cope with high viscosity uh, mixtures. And this is something which really goes over something from a solution type of coating, maybe even into hot melt. Um, the upper limit is difficult to determine, but it can be really high viscous if you go to different coating heads. Which polymers come available by foaming, and how do you manufacture these films in comparison to regular OTFs? That's something I would uh, rather not disclose in detail. There are some patents of ours out there. I would say these are usually, I would say, all synthetic polymers known from our, our dosage forms, so nothing very specific for OTFs. So they're either monographed or out there. It's, it's something unique to, to choose polymers which have these forming characteristics, and there is a handful which you can use. You can also use HVMC as the easiest one, but as you can already hear from my saying, this is not the favorite polymer of choice. Um, the way they are made, this is kind of proprietary to, to LTS, and uh, um, I can only invite the, the person answering asking the question to 
send an email to us and uh, under the CDA we are happy to disclose the details on how this is processed. It's, it's pretty unique, pretty interesting, but it's not rocket science, but uh, you have to control this from the process. So something which can be in the first step done in a lot of labs. Thank you, Marco. What are typical drug loads used for OTFs? And do you use predictive models to determine the solubility of the API within the matrix? That's a good point. Um, the drug solubility, I think at the end of the day, we are doing a lot of testing to make sure that we get the right solubility since these are rather complex formulations. Even if you already know that within a certain polymer, you might have a certain solubility uh, by adding all sorts of excipients, this might change, so you end up with testing. Uh, the drug loading in the film, so percentage-wise, this is always the holy grail. How much can you dissolve or, really dis or disperse? I would say this is similar like all other uh, amorphous solid dispersions where you can di dissolve an API or have a, have a amorphous API in a, in a drug polymer mixture in a range between 10 and maybe 50%. If it's dispersed, it can even go beyond that depending on the API properties, but this is really comparable with uh, uh, solid dispersion made by extrusion or, or other technologies, and uh, since these are the similar polymers which we're using. Do LTS have any interest in buccal delivery of peptides to counter food effects and liver first pass effects? Interest, yes. <laughs> Absolutely, and we also had did already projects on peptides, but uh, this is also kind of a maybe not a holy grail, but a huge challenge. And since our focus is a lot to to to, to pursue projects at the end of the day, have, which have the opportunity to make a commercial product on the market, and this is a still so far kind of academic uh, uh, question and, and and looking at this, but. I think we need maybe a combination of with nanotechnologies, etc., to overcome the barrier to have a significant increase in bioavailability. Because so far, it's strictly depending on size, and I would say peptides, you're in a lower one-digit one percentage range, and that's commercially not really suitable. But of interest, yes. Great. Were the case studies performed with the phone? Let me think. No. None of them. Okay, that's an easy one. Is the of the API affected by using a foam formulation? Mm. I would say not in general. So it's it's mainly driven by all the excipients, and uh, so. In, in, if if, the, if a, an API has a certain instability, like oxidation or hydrolysis or so, this would be maybe also depending on other properties, but not specifically by the foam. And um, what is the largest mass of insoluble solids you can load in milligrams into a single OTF dose? It's always the holy great question, and uh, it, it's a broad range way which you can answer and. Uh, there are also competitors of ours which, which give you a certain range. And this is really depending on the size and the thickness of the film that you would think is acceptable for the patient. So I think the absolute, absolute total maximum which would be achieved is somewhere in the range between 50 and 100 milligrams. But as said, this comes along with already with a larger uh, OTF. If you're looking at the sublingual delivery, uh, uh, 50 milligrams is already pretty challenging since the film still has to be applied sublingually, so that's about the range. But this is very often depending on the APA properties and on the question how much drug we can actually load in the film. Now, if I can only load 20 or 30 percent due to some instabilities, other things, of course it has a direct impact on the total loading since the film should not be too large and too thick. So how long could the delivery be sustained? I mean, I've, I've shown before these uh, melt-away films which disintegrate within about 30 to 30 minutes, maybe. 
and maybe a bucket patch can stay for a very few hours. I think the maximum we always did was in range of, of, of uh, three, four hours or something like this. I think from the patient's perspective, from the compliance perspective, um, nobody wants to have a patch in it or a cavity for more than that. Especially, you don't want to want to remove a film after a certain time, like you do with the transdermal system. We remove a patch um, after a day or so and, and replace it. I think nobody wants to go back in his cheek and, and scratch out the film. So this comes on comes along with the patient compliance. So beyond beyond that, I think an OTF would not be really suitable to deliver the drug. It's, I think it's, everything is pretty pretty fast. I would say. And what is the thickest and the thinnest thin film formulation possible to manufacture? The thinnest is a good point. I think I don't know exactly what the commercial products on the market look like. I would say it's somewhere in a range maybe of 80, 80 microns. Maybe because at below a certain point it becomes too thin, too brittle. Uh, and, and if you take them into your finger, you have a tendency to stick. And so I think there's a lower limit by the mechanical stability. The upper limit, depending on how, what is acceptable for the patients, a lingual film is a good point. I mean, if you go more than 200 microns, it will dissolve too slowly, just too much polymers, then you can end up with, for example, the foam is much thicker. I cannot disclose the actual thickness, but since it's a foam, it doesn't matter, it still disintegrates. Yeah. So that's difficult to answer the question because it always also depends on the formulation. What is the OTF shelf life compared to a dry formulation of the same API, for example, a tablet? It depends if the API is dissolved or dispersed in the firm. If it's dispersed, it's, it's similar to something which we can achieve with a tablet since there's a the API is in a solid form. Of course, there's a lower tendency to have any degradation uh, uh, coming on. I would say we might be not be as long as a normal simple, simple tablet, but we can achieve similar shelf lives in a certain range. Yeah. Two years is easily achievable. Three years, maybe. Yeah, beyond that, that's something which is very API dependent. It's not about the film. The film properties stay the same. I think. Great. Can natural polymer be used to avoid synthetic claim? In a way, yes. But I don't see the necessity because the polymers we're using come along with from, from oral dosage forms, so from tablets, tablet coatings, etc. So, yeah, maybe, but uh, it comes along with a lot of challenges to get these synthetic polymers in a stable product. I think we are. It's much easier to formulate with with synthetic or semi-synthetic polymers. Great. Just a few more here, Marco. We're nearly there. Uh, are OTFs offering any benefit to special patient groups, such as children, um, child safety, or elderly people? Are they senior friendly? Uh, I think yes, both. And there, there's literature around uh, on on clinical studies, especially on, on on children, here from a from a university group here in Germany, and also on on elderly people. So it doesn't have to be swallowed. It's it's also easier than taking the syrup, for example, as a con comparison for children. Uh, it's easier to dose. So yes, I would say both um, came a clear positive answer, and have been shown in literature already. Can you compare oral thin films with other oral disintegrating tablets? I think the advantage of an OTF, especially when you look for a sublingual application, is that we are addressing a larger surface area of the mucosal tissue. So by their direct comparison of an, an oral disintegrating tablet with an, with an OTF, even if the disintegrating time is pretty similar, I think we can still achieve a higher bioavailability since it's larger areas formed. I think the transmucosal delivery, everything is about time, timing, having the right conditions, have the right surface addressed. So and so the whole job is done until the patient is swallowing the remains of the API and then it's gone. So 
So I think there we have kind of an advantage since we are spreading to a larger area. And what are the limitations on using OTFs as an alternative oral dosage form? Yeah, drug loading, I think that's the first limitation. So uh, uh, several hundred milligrams of a standard OTF are not feasible. So there we have to pass immediately. But uh, usually APIs we're looking at are have a lower dosing, especially for those who want to increase the bioavailability. So if we cannot achieve that within uh, a two-digit milligram range, uh, I think that's, that's the really absolute limit of all that. Um, yeah, that's that's what I can think of the main, main limitations. Are. Okay, and then the last question here, Marco. We have an intranasal spray in development. Would it be possible to use an oral film alternatively? I think I think yes. So especially if you go into a sublingual route where you allow the API to achieve a higher bioavailability. Um, so if you if it, I mean depending on the API properties, but if it goes through the um, mucosal tissue intranasally, which is slightly different tissue, but still there's a chance of doing so. Uh, if it's not not a peptide maybe directly or, or a vaccine, but a small molecule, yeah, that would should be a feasible issue. A feasible route, especially, I think, an OTF is much more, from the patient perspective, uh, suitable than a nasal spray, depending on the drug loading, of course. Yeah. Brilliant. Well, that's all of them, Marco. Thank you for for getting through them and for your insightful answers. Um, we'll end the session there. Marco, thank you for the presentation, and then thank you, Casey, for yours as well. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in for answering the polls and for all of your questions right just now. I hope you found the session interesting. We'll be back with more webinars over the coming weeks. Um, this session has been recorded, so keep an eye out for an email from us with a link to watch the recording online. Take care.